Good afternoon, and welcome to this event hosted by the School of International Service at American University. My name is Carolyn Gallagher, and I'm the Senior Associate Dean here in SIS. Dean Chen cannot make it today and sends her apologies. I'm excited to introduce our guest and our moderator for today's discussion. Before I do that, however, I wanna recognize some people who have made this event possible. This event is co-sponsored by the AU Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. I am so proud of our two-person team at the center, Malini Ranganathan and Christine Platt, and the work that they're doing. This has been a bang up year under their leadership. Today's, today's event is also made possible by the generosity of SIS alumni, Matthew and Cynthia Warshaw. Matt and Cindy are members of the Dean's Board of Advisors, and they are dedicated partners in our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and anti-racism. Recent national tragedies, which have highlighted the unequal experiences of minority communities, inspired Matt and Cindy to convene scholars and experts through a four-part anti-racism lecture series. Thank you, Matt and Cindy, for empowering our community to learn, reflect, and act on the urgent need to dismantle racism. Now a little bit of business. This discussion will last for about an hour with a Q&A session towards the end of the event. If you would like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. Answers to the questions will not be typed into the Q&A function, but the closed captions will include all responses. This webinar is recorded and available on the SIS YouTube channel afterwards. Now to our esteemed guest and moderator. Glenn Colthart is Yellow Knives Deny and an Associate Professor of the First Nations and Indigenous Studies Program and the Department of Political Science at the University of the British Columbia. He teaches courses in Indigenous politics and social movements, and he is the author of Red Skin, White Masks, Rejecting the Colonial Politics of Recognition. Glenn is also co-founder of the Dechen Tai Center for Research and Learning, a decolonial indigenous land-based post-secondary program operating in his traditional territories and Den and Day, known also as Northwest Territories. Our moderator for today is Professor Elizabeth Rule, who is an enrolled citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Elizabeth teaches at the George Washington University and is the director of the AT&T Center for Indigenous Politics and Policy at GW. She also is currently an MIT Indigenous Communities Fellow and the creator of the Guide to Indigenous DC mobile app. Elizabeth, I'm really happy to welcome you here to lead this discussion. And Glenn, I'm also pleased to welcome you to SIS. Let me now turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, again, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Rule. I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, and I'm joining you all today from um, the George Washington University campus. Um, I'm also so pleased to welcome our esteemed guest, Glenn Coldhard, and I'd love to jump into a discussion. Um, I know we're going to have a really robust Q&A afterward, but just to kick us off, I have a couple of questions about your work. Um, so first, you know, your work inspires those working in both academic and activist arenas, and it does so by tracing the history of settler colonialism and the changing methods that the state deploys in order to further indigenous dispossession. Can you tell us more about the politics of recognition and the relationship that you draw between settler colonialism and capitalism? Uh, yes, uh, thanks Elizabeth. I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for the wonderful invitation. I'm uh, coming to you from, um, from Vancouver, which is the traditional territory in this part of Vancouver of the Musqueam people on whose lands uh, UBC is also situated. So I just wanna give a shout out to um, the host communities that, that uh, we take very seriously in terms of, in terms of uh, working with and having good relations with. So. The politics of recognition. Yeah. Um, so it's been a while since I've kind of, uh, it took 10 years to write that book. Um, the book was really kind of conceived of in a, in a context of liberal uh, governance and rule. Uh, so when the book came out, it was, uh, it was the conservatives that were in power in British Columbia, and they actually um, didn't play by the recognition rules as much as, as, uh, as the, the governing liberals did. And by that, I mean, um, um, recognition kind of emphasized a form of colonial governance uh, 
that saw indigenous people's cultural identities and interests as important to safeguard uh, because that's important for for um, upholding and uh, liberal democratic uh, principles such as individual freedom equality well-being dignity and all these sorts of things so indigenous peoples are seen as cultural entities that need um, state protection for their cultural interests and that's how recognition works the problem with doing so um, has been that indigenous uh, nationhood is circumscribed and placed in a subordinate relationship to canada um, and canadian interests including economic interests so indigenous peoples get to have their uh, cultures affirmed and recognized through various state arrangements whether it's self-government or or um or um um, economic initiatives where Indigenous uh, peoples are able to participate in, in the development and exploitation of their own resources to a certain extent. Uh, but this is always subordinate to the interests of capital and settlement. So, so I, the book really kind of makes the case uh, for a, a politics that kind of pushes away from uh, the symbolic realm of recognition and, and more through um, indigenous assertions and self-fashionings um, that reattach them to those important sources of the strength, including the land. Wonderful. Um, you know, it's, it's so important. And just building off of, of what you've said so far, you know, the findings of your study really point to some of those dead ends that Indigenous communities can encounter when they place too much stock in demand-based politics or political parties, like you said. Um, and you also gestured towards some of those limitations of international rights-based approaches, um, most notably such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or UNDRIP. Um, could you speak to these limitations and share some examples of Indigenous communities who are effectively turning to resurgence and regeneration outside of the state in order to further their goals and priorities? Yeah, so the main, the main argument that I develop has drawn significantly in conversation with third world theorists like Franz Fanon. And, uh, and his views on, on recognition. And, and essentially what he said is that when you're negotiating uh, for the recognition of your identities or your rights or, or whatever um, with a colonizer, um, you'll only be recognized to the extent that the colonizer's interests aren't undermined through that process. So he says that there's a structural sort of um, a constraint placed on the types of recognition you're going to be able to gain through through negotiation. Um, but Fanon was also like a, a militant psychiatrist, and he also saw that this had an impact on how we understood ourselves and the worlds that we inhabit um, in ways that can obscure the inequality of that relationship between colonizer and colonized. Um, so this is really important because recognition not only is a limited constraint built into it, but it can appear as if it's doing the work of justice um, to those who are subject to those forms of recognition. So when you think of this in the context of negotiating over rights, for instance, um, my concern is that those rights will still be circumscribed in a way that allow corporations and non-natives and and uh, and the state to gain access to indigenous people's territories so dispossession but m provide the appearance that it's doing something else like it's performing an act of reconciliation that it's holding up indigenous people's rights rather than undermining them so this is what I, I, I claim has happened in the in the Canadian case and more so in the last 40 years because prior to the 1960s, Canada and most Canadians didn't really care about Indigenous peoples or their rights. Uh, they only became recognized as important constitutionally or whatever through the 60s and into the 80s to the present. Um, but those rights are still subordinated to the interests of capital. Uh, they're subordinated to the interests of settlement and they're supported, uh, subordinated to the interests of corporations gaining access to our lands and resources as indigenous peoples. Uh, now at the international level, um, I would suspect, and I think that there's evidence towards uh, 
to demonstrate this is that the logic of recognition still plays uh, rings true, whether or not it's at the domestic constitutional level or it's at the UN level. The interests of states and accumulation still reign supreme and indigenous recognition is circumscribed within a comfort zone that allows that ongoing access to indigenous people's territories for the purposes of settlement and capitalist development. And that's built right into UN DRIP itself. Um, so, so I would suggest that yes, there's similar dynamics that happen at the at the local level, but also the international level, and it still plays that role of, of presenting itself like it's doing more than it's actually structurally capable of doing, like offering indigenous peoples a reconciliation through a granting of recognition of their rights. Yeah, so, so important, um, you know, to, to use this lens to analyze contemporary events. And, um, you know, just going off of that, are there examples um, of Indigenous communities that you're aware of or have, have witnessed, worked with, um, that are operating, you know, somewhat outside of that state model, um, really through a model of resurgence, regeneration? Um, and are they seeing success with that? And, and what does that look like? First, I, I don't think it's an either or sort of position like we live in a messy political world which um, which demands that we do whatever we can in any given moment to ensure safety and justice for our communities or families or whatever. So if, if you're subject to some sort of violence or abuse, sometimes you may or may not have to call the state in order to intervene, whether or not that's through the cops or, or whatever. And I'm not claiming that a turn away from, like to turn away from that um, would just be unrealistic, but you do see people who are um, um, activists in communities who are on the front lines, who are trying to think past that. So what would it mean to not invite police into one's community in order to protect one's, one's community interests by building up a, an infrastructure of care within a community that would support support our own and others. So you see that happening. And then on the front lines and more kind of direct action context, um, if you want your land and community defended, um, we're seeing people like in Innistoten or, or even in the downtown east side of Vancouver through the Braided Warriors or Red, Red Alliance, um, they're blocking flows of uh, capital and power entering and exiting indigenous territories by putting their bodies on the line and building up a community infrastructure that's able to protect those interests um, in ways that are kind of like um, suspending the, the compulsion to uh, demand that that be done um, uh, by state actors who have no, no interest in, in doing so because it counters their their existence for living, gaining access to Indigenous people's territories for development purposes and for settlement. Um, so I just like looking at those instances of prefiguration where one's, one's collective assertions um, kind of create the communities and infrastructures that would provide alternatives to, um, to uh, turning towards the state or corporate interests uh, to demand recognition that they have no they have no um, incentive to be to be providing us as as nations. Absolutely. I mean, what you're saying about, um, you know, even this infrastructure of care um, and turning inward toward community um, for some of these resources, um, things like alternatives to policing community protection. Um, I know that that is a conversation that we're having a lot um, in, in the US context, even outside of the indigenous context as well um, with all minoritized populations. Um, and it's a really good transition into my next question, um, which is that, you know, your, an your analysis in Red Skin White Masks focuses on Indigenous populations in the Canadian context. Um, but how does your work translate or does it not translate to the U.S. context? Um, and furthermore, how do we apply your findings to the challenges um, that Indigenous communities uh, pose to settler state borders? And how do we embrace um, the Indigenous conceptualization of this land as Turtle Island? 
Wow, <laughs> that's a great question and a big one. Uh, the comparative element, I think, exists, but um, it's like the um, the politics of recognition in the Canadian context is a creature of and kind of in a familial relationship with multiculturalism. So it's an understanding that in diverse contexts, uh, sometimes it's important to provide group rights uh, that protect cultural interests because this is important for for liberalism and, and democracy and, and so on. This is a less pronounced ideology in the US than it is in Canada, where we have public intellectuals like Charles Taylor and, and philosophers that have advocated um, for the recognition of cultural and national rights within a, a unitary state because of the existence of First Nations and because of the existence of, of Quebec in particular. Um, the US has been less inclined to offer these symbolic gestures of recognition um, over kind of the melting pot sort of unitary sovereignty sort of model. So, so there's some ways in which it doesn't, but there's also some ways in which it does, like the, the relationship between settler colonialism and state formation and capitalism is absolutely fundamental in the same way. And I think that Marx has a lot to say about that um, through his, um, his writings on primitive accumulation, for instance. Um, I think that a lot of the movements that you're seeing kind of animate Indigenous sovereignty and propel Indigenous politics are ones that are very similar as well. There's, they're blocking critical infrastructure that um, are conduits for the exploitation of Indigenous people's label, la labor and bodies and their land bases. So Standing Rock is an ex excellent example of this. Um, so there's a lot of overlap as well, too. And, and a lot of this, I think, has historical roots in, in forms of Indigenous resistance, um, historically, but also through the 1960s, where Indigenous peoples are looking towards other struggles within, within the world and within, within the polity itself, um, whether that's Black liberation or anti-colonial movements in Africa, in order to think through what that might look like um, internal to uh, to colonial states rather than internationally between uh, kind of European and, and its colonial holdings. Um, so there's a lot of overlap, I think, that we can learn from. And uh, there's a lot of similarities in terms of, in terms of uh, how Indigenous politics and freedom is expressed through, uh, through the importance of land and establishing reciprocal relationships with, with our, our neighbors who find themselves in in, in violent situations as well because of the state and, and an ongoing persistent colonialism. And now I wanna continue building on this topic of land um, that you brought up. So as more and more universities and institutions are performing land acknowledgements um, and, and here at American University, we've even developed an initiative around the leg legacies, excuse me, of enslavement and settler colonialism on campus. So, um, you know, as universities and institutions are doing that, could you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the importance of this work, um, what people should uh, keep an eye out for as they seek to be allies with Indigenous communities? Um, and also, I'd be very interested in hearing more about your own land-based work. Um, and again, you know, the particular importance of land to Indigenous resurgence. Yeah, the land acknowledgements are, are critically important in so far as they are the effect of Indigenous peoples and their allies struggle to like uh, place um, just ran, land relationships on the, on the political agenda, bringing them to the fore of public consciousness. But as any form of recognition, you have to be wary of what it's capable of doing, um, but more importantly of what it's capable of obscuring. So for instance, if like the University of British Columbia has a land acknowledgement that's built into almost all communications and it states that uh, the University of British Columbia um, um, would like to thank uh, the Musqueam people on whose unceded territories uh, the university now occupies. Um, legally speaking, that's, a, that's um, recognizing a, a, a form of theft. 
Um, so insofar as a land acknowledgement recognizes the injustice of an, uh, as a state of ongoing dispossession or theft, um, then you would think that any sort of resolution would be uh, moved beyond an acknowledgement to some sort of restitution of that or like some sort of dealing materially with that injustice. And if you're not dealing materially with that injustice, then what sort of forms of like, is it obscuring or providing some sort of ideological cover for the ongoing nature of that? So that would be my concern with land acknowledgements. Um, the other issue is like, I think that we need to recognize whenever we're speaking of land and its role in decolonization and decolonization, that there's, a rad there's radically different conceptions of land at play um, when you hear indigenous, many indigenous articulations of it and what you would hear when it's coming from, uh, from non-native people often or, or more importantly through institutions of state and capital. Um, I have come to understand through community work um, and through and through research and writing and um, that land is a like a fundamentally a relational sort of understanding coming from uh, from a Dene perspective um, which is antithetical to the forms of kind of accumulation enclosure partitioning off alienation um, that land um, is assumed um, as almost derives its value of within more Western European traditions. So when, when there's a call for land back, for instance, um, by activists in Canada, Canada or, or wherever that are on the front lines, and they're calling a return of land, it's a return of land to that kind of relational understanding um, and not one that divides um, the land or, or the community's access to it. So, so I have been doing work like this with the Dene in the context of education. It's like if education has served a genocidal sort of function historically by separating indigenous peoples from the lands that, uh, that, that kind of give them sustenance in life uh, through residentials or, or boarding schools, then any sort of decolonial education is going to serve as a re kind of introduction or introduction of those of, of, of indigenous peoples to and back into the social relationships that constitute our understandings of land. So we do that by, um, by drawing on elders knowledge, by drawing on land itself and holding, um, using the practices that kind of animate those relationships with land moose eye tanning, fishing, hunting, um, um, kind of the, the learning history through kind of um, what's inscribed in storytelling and legal traditions embedded in place. Uh, we reintroduce students to that source of critical knowledge and then, and then have them draw off of that knowledge to analyze and understand their present circumstances and how we might move forward in a more just and, and decolonized sort of way. Um, so we do that through semesters that are held on, out on, on our territory, working with elders uh, to showcase that other form of critical knowledge that supplements what we might learn in books, uh, but, but through this very, very kind of embodied practical um, ethical relationship with with community and and the land itself um, and it's some of my favorite work that I do and it has a transformative effect on on the students that are are being reintroduced into those relationships with place and 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 community that sounds amazing um, and what an awesome opportunity for those students to take part in that and um, you know receive that that learning and education from you know a variety of different sources um, that's that's just wonderful to hear about that work um, and so interesting 
Um, and so, uh, again, I, w- I want to keep on this thread a little bit here and, you know, again, apply some of, you know, the findings and work that you've done to um, our context here in the U.S., um, but also specifically in Washington, D.C. Um, many of our students are zooming in from all over the country and maybe all over the world. Um, But of course, in normal circumstances, uh, AU students live and work, um, study here in Washington, DC, um, the nation's capital. Um, And so especially in a place like DC, we oftentimes see this push and pull between protest and politics. Um, In many ways, that's, you know, what our city is famous for, right? Um, And and that's certainly one of the most appealing parts um, of this this location to students who want to come and get involved in that process in one way or another. And so I want to spend a few minutes discussing some of the direct action elements um, of Indigenous empowerment that you take up in your work. And and what are some ways that non-Native allies can support Native communities, whether it be on more of that protest, direct action side, or if it's more on the political side? Yeah, that's uh, a very, uh, again, uh, Good set of questions. Uh, in the book, and generally, kind of my politics leans towards the significance of a more confrontational sort of direct action politics, because I think that empirically speaking and historically, it's done the most in order to propel sort of concern and rights uh, protections forward. Um, Um, It's often represented that it's a detriment to kind of getting Indigenous peoples respected and their rights and interests upheld. Um, And it's often done by kind of characterizing like good Indians who negotiate within the kind of civil bounds of whatever the negotiation tables whose terms are offered to us um, by the colonizer versus the bad Indians who are blocking roads and railways and stuff like that. Uh, But historically speaking, um, all of those negotiations and any sort of headway that they've gained, at least in the Canadian context, has piggybacked uh, significantly, if not entirely, off of the more assertive politics that you see on the front lines. Um, Whether or not this is advancing the interests of Indigenous women and girls and queer and two-spirit peoples um, in the downtown east side of of Vancouver to what's happening in Udmistotin and Wood'sotawin territory blocking pipelines. Um, It's always dependent on that. So I just want to kind of, and any other argument I think is um, is is uh, is mistaken or or at least only partially um, 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 formulated. Um, So when it comes to allyship, it's not necessarily calling on people to put their bodies on the line in that sort of way, but it is providing, like it's important to provide both material and educational support to what those movements are about and what they're trying to accomplish. So for instance, people like indigenous people who have taken up and sacrificed their lives in order to defend their land and communities um, from the encroachment of of man camps to to, uh, the exploitation of their their lands and rivers and waterways, um, those people are putting themselves in harm's way and um, and they suffer repercussions for that, often legal or monetary. So the, one of the things is to provide material support to those types of movements, um, which means money or, or, or other forms of material support. Um, the other thing as an educator that I think is absolutely crucial is to take up that important work of educating um, the ignorant on the significance of these, not only for indigenous peoples, but for the sustainability of the planet and environment more generally. Um, and that can be exhausting um, to have as a burden on top of the, the kind of frontline work that people are doing is to also um, be, be preaching and educating to a resentful white public that, that has historically not really um, given much concern um, to, to the issues that affect us. So I like to 
leave those very two tangible sort of suggestions out there is um, support materially um, what's happening in these communities, um, support legally um, um, through donations and what have you, um, um, the defenders of these communities through these actions, but also uh, do the work that you have to do educating yourself, uh, but also others. So Indigenous peoples don't have to take on that also um, burden on top of kind of the efforts that they're undertaking to defend their communities and lands from, from violation. So education and material support are two, are, are two uh, pretty uncontroversial ways that people can contribute to, to a more just relationship between Indigenous peoples and, and, and other societies. Some amazing uh, suggestions, and I'm sure people at home are, are jotting this down. Um, at least I hope that they are, um, because we always need more allies. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and just like and a couple, like, um, so there's been legal, um, there was a blockade or like a, a blockade uh, towards the Port of Vancouver by uh, the Braided Warriors, so they're on Instagram and they look for legal defense uh, money. Uh, you have the Tiny House Warriors who are defending uh, Saputmuk territories by Indigenous women. Um, so you, it's not too difficult to look up these 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 folks grassroots uh, and 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 uh, see what material needs they need in order to keep doing the incredibly important work that they're doing. So. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so just to wrap up our conversation before we go to the q and I have one remaining question. And to all of our um, audience members who are enjoying this conversation, if you have a question for our esteemed guest, please um, use the Q&A format in Zoom to type your question in. Um, we're going to save about the last 20 minutes or so to hear from you. Um, so if you have a question, please use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, just to bring us home and wrap up my moderated portion of our time with you today, um, can you tell us what's next? What are you working on right now? What are you thinking about? Um, what is you know, keeping you up at night or inspiring you? Um, just, yeah, can you tell us what we can expect next? Uh, yeah, it's a pretty fun project. Um... Some of the uh, over over like the the book that I had written was written kind of like it was on the cusp of I was concluding it during one of the bigger kind of protest movements that Indigenous peoples had seen um, in Canada in the last thirty or forty years with I don't know more. Um, but that was kind of on the decline in terms of it, like it's the urgency of it was dissipating by the time that the book came out in the late, late, late 2014 and Black Lives Matter was on the kind of political horizon. So I was really kind of wanting to th think through or tell a fuller story about the intersections between Black liberation and Indigenous liber decolonization. Um, told historically through the relationships that that Red um, and Black Power had, but also the relationships that that um, um, and inspiration that these domestic uh, movements had with the global or international realm through the anti-colonial movements in Africa and South America and so on. Um, so all of this is in buried in. Uh, implicitly in red skin white mass through its inspirations like indigenous conversations with kind of the Marxist traditions but also but also anti-colonial third world sort of traditions of people like Frantz Fanon but it's implicit so the new book kind of looks at the actual theoretical cross fertilizations the collaborations between black and red power um, its relationship to uh, the non-allied movements and theoretical sort of influence of Maoism um, told through the two places that really kind of served as a backdrop to my own intellectual and political development. So British Columbia um, um, and, its, and, and indigenous politics here over the last 30 or 40 years and the Northwest Territories, which is where my own communities are from and, and how that implicitly shaped my interests, both intellectual or otherwise, but kind of 
as a, a habitus that that shaped my understanding of who I am and what's important. So, in short, it's a book on um, it's a book on Maoist influences on red power, told through through the various various a actors and militants, um, theory builders in British Columbia and Northwest Territories in the sixties and seventies. So, in a way, it's kind of like a preface to the book that that I wrote in 2014 or published in 2014 uh, filling out some of some of those international details in the relationship with black liberation it's an incredibly fun book to write <laughs> well it sounds fascinating um and i'm sure many of us are going to keep our eyes open um for that um yeah can't can't wait to read it can't wait to get my hands on it when it comes out um so thank you so much um, for answering those questions, for speaking with us today. And again, to our nearly 100 participants joining us, if you have a question for Dr. Coldhard, please um, drop it in the Q&A. We already have a number of questions that folks have written in, um, and I'm just gonna start at the top here. Um, we have first, hi, Professor Coldhard, glad to be able to join you all today. Would you be able to talk a bit about how you maintain relationships with indigenous communities outside the university? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's just kind of hard work. Like you have to be able to, to um, it's important for, for many communities that, and including my own, one of the most important things that you can demonstrate is presence. Uh, presence, not only physically, but kind of uh, constantly in communication and, and being attentive to um, community needs and aspirations. So as an educator, it's particularly in relationship to research, in relationship to providing to the extent that we can wrestle money away from the state and redistribute that into community to showcase indigenous knowledge and the relationships with land, uh, not only now, but hopefully into the future. So it's it's a matter of just, of, of leaving the, 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 academic community and kind of investing your time and energy into learning what what indigenous communities wants and then and then finding the material ways to be able to support those projects so that's what the chinta that land-based university or uh, the post-secondary programming that i do uh, does it works hard with a team of people to take money from different places and redistribute it into into the, the Dene knowledge economy that reconnects um, and pays indigenous knowledge holders to do what they do as Dene and that's be out on the land, um, working with and harvesting animals and redistributing that, that value back into the, into the community materially, but also uh, through showcasing the importance of that knowledge as, a, as an alternative to, to the extraction industries that dominate the North. Great, great, great question to kick us off. Um, next we have, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Coldhard. We at AU's Anti-Racism Anti Center and SIS are honored to be hosting this conversation today. Do you think the mainstreaming of anti-racism in today's context has sidelined, appropriated, or otherwise erased indigenous politics and resistance, particularly more radical demands? What is the indigenous provocation or perhaps challenge to contemporary anti-racist politics? Well, I th that's a good question. I'd have to think about it, but intuitively I think that an anti-racist politics uh, can flatten the important distinctions that communities face and the violences that they face, either from kind of um, white society or the institutions that uphold those those values. So in the case, so um, they can, oh, like in the generalization and kind of lumping in all racisms into one, um, we can obscure um, more than clarify. And I think that I've learned this most from, um, from the literature and arguments around the specificity of anti-Black uh, racism compared to others. Uh, but also when we're talking about Indigenous struggles, the ways that it faces a territorial foundation to the forms of violence that Indigenous peoples um, face as well. So 
So yes, I think that just generic sort of gestures towards anti-racism can um, can draw away from a more substantively material understanding and contextual understanding. Um, but that also just requires us to listen more and to engage more with with the voices of people who are expressing the violences that they they experience and the solutions that they would like to see um, happen. Um, um, in their specificity and, and kind of the way that they concretely are being expressed to us. So that's just my intuitive sort of reaction is that, yeah, um, any sort of generic answers probably are, um, are not doing the amount that, that they can, um, especially we, when we kind of get to understand the, the more nuanced context in which those voices are expressing their concerns from. Great, thank you. Um, another really important question. Next we have, I'm curious what approaches have you found to work best when teaching indigenous, or excuse me, when teaching students about indigenous peoples, their history, culture, traditions, particularly when students may feel or believe that it's not important or may even say, so what? So I think this question is really, um, again, you know, what approaches have you found uh, best to teaching non-Indigenous audiences about Indigenous people and um, what what do you have to say to people who um, sort of disregard uh, the importance of these topics? I think one of the ways just generally speaking is to show how these are significant to the to all questions of like in the Canadian context this is slightly different I think than in the American context and even in British Columbia is different than most of Canada British Columbia doesn't have treaties that were signed with it, which Canada will often represent as a way in which it like legitimates its sovereignty over those territories. So British Columbia has a big legal question mark that has been a pain in the ass for Canada and British Columbia uh, for its in, since it's been around. And that question demands us to ask who owns this and what are the rules that, that govern it? Um, so this has been referred to as the Indian land question in British Columbia and it's anxiety that all non-Indigenous peoples have always had existing in this territory. Um, so as an educator, you're able to, like there's already a, in BC a pronounced sort of urgency to some resolution to this question, um, which makes it already an important <laughs> issue. Um, even if the importance produces hostility by, by non-Native people. Um, so I am blessed with working in a political context where Indigenous rights and the questions of sovereignty and land are already an anxiety that is as addressed. So I don't have to do all that much explaining. Um, you have to explain why um, this needs a just resolution to, to people, particularly in political science, like white men who are like, well, um, isn't this part of the past or, or uh, can't we just, uh, shouldn't we all just move on, blah, 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 blah. And I think that there's ways to do that to show like, well, look, let's look at the, the kind of real world ongoing consequences of what you're representing as the past. And if you can get that into their brains, then you throw in the second argument was, well, what if it isn't past? Like, let's look at these policies from a political science perspective. Um, these are the policies that still separate Indigenous peoples from their lands. These are the policies that still sanction the, viol the violence against Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit queer folks um, in urban contexts. These are not past policies. These are very much uh, structural injustices that still animate our existence in the present. Now, if you're like a kind of an unrepentant colonizer, um, that that doesn't respond to that. That's when I kind of I move on and, and choose somebody else to have a, a fruitful conversation with because um, I'm not going to waste my time for somebody who just who doesn't have any sort of uh, sense of right or wrong and proceed on that uh, on that path in terms of um, my argument. Uh, but to demonstrate that these are these are not the issues of the past, they very much structure people's lives in the present, 
And many indigenous claims to rectify those injustices are not just for them, but for the well being of generations and our relationships, our neighbors, um, um, and the land itself. I think is a great way to kind of to bring people into a, a more substantive conversation about the importance of decolonization um, and 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 establishing better relationships with each other and and the land that sustains us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that thoughtful response. Um, as someone that also is an Indigenous person, oftentimes teaching non-Indigenous people about um, Indigenous issues, um, that's, that's so inspiring and useful to hear. Um, next, we have two questions that are somewhat different, but also somewhat related. They have to deal with contemporary political events in the US. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase and, and join them together. Um, the first is thank you for your time and comments today. What are your hopes for Deb Holland becoming US Secretary of the Interior? And then secondly, um, we have someone writing in, what do you think about the fact that some federally recognized tribes in the US use their money to fight politically against the federal recognition of other tribes? So two sort of paraphrased questions about contemporary US politics and indigenous communities. Uh, one of the things that I learned quite quickly as a scholar and, and somebody who works with community is not to uh, overextend my realm of expertise. So I won't speak too much about the first question. Uh, I can generalize about the second. And part of the problem with the politics of recognition is that it pits uh, it pits you know, interests against one another. So if I'm if I'm if I'm demanding recognition of my land rights, and I have to make that legible to the state in the way that it understands land or territory, that is like very demarcated sort of uh, a very demarcated geography. Um, in which you're asserting jurisdiction over and control over to the exclusion of others, then you're obviously going to run into a divide and rule position when, when arguing, when, when your competitor is doing the same and they might be an unrecognized tribe or community. So it's like we're, the politics of recognition in that sort of way um, will naturally serve that sort of end. So for instance, in my community in the 1970s, when we were offered the opportunity to negotiate our land rights, Indigenous peoples were kind of trying to um, argue um, uh, for some sort of just terms for negotiations that included everybody within our territory, including the five regions that constitute the Northwest Territories at that time. And um, the federal government refused to negotiate on the unified front, but the, what they said is we'll negotiate with each of you individually. So you put, so one region of people is making a claim to negotiate individually, but they're obviously going to be negotiating over lands and areas that were historically shared. And then so that that kind of compels conflict between their neighbors and then their neighbors now have to negotiate the extinguishment of their rights in order to gain some sort of protection over them. And then their neighbors start freaking out because uh, these places were traditionally shared. So you see how the negotiation dictated through the state over territory and rights pit Indigenous peoples' interests against each other in ways that are very problematic and result in the types of um, the types of concerns and questions that you're that you ask with respect to uh, recognized and unrecognized tribes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, another question, in your personal opinion, have NGOs been helpful in promoting Indigenous rights or have they, whether intentionally or unintentionally, upheld a victim savior framework? I think that's a specific question. You have to ask what NGOs. Um, I'm a little bit more strate like strategically open when it comes to looking at the usefulness of NGOs and advancing certain community rights or, or causes. So, so like um, some NGOs um, 
or charities even like or charity status folks have have uh, been able to wrestle important resources away from states and and other sources of money and redistribute them into communities in ways that meet those communities needs and aspirations so De Chinta, for instance takes money from as a as a as a uh, as a charitable organization um, advocates super hard to get money away from Canada in order to redistribute it into the indigenous economy um, for education purposes, but also for paying people to be back on the land and teaching about why that life is significant in perpetuity. At a kind of in a more um, like puritanical version of me as like in my 20s, I would have said that that was just all sellout nonsense. Um, but I see an important, an important function that is meeting the aspirations, incredibly anti-colonial and to a certain extent in this context, anti-capitalist, um, and through, through the redistribution of those, of those resources, which NGOs and charitable organizations are, are taking the lead from indigenous people and communities um, to to use that labor to redirect those resources into their communities and economies. But again, <laughs> I think that the question is right in the sense that that's not always the way that it happens. And there's an infrastructure of NGO sort of work um, at home and abroad that can continue or reinforce or reproduce colonial relationships more than actually alleviate them or undermine them. Thank you, thank you. Um, and now we have a question about environmental issues. Um, so this person writes, thinking about climate justice and how there's a growing understanding that the current norms and practices of consumption that belie the capitalist economy are not possible in the just transition to a carbon-free world. So they say, in other words, people with immense privilege with regards to resource and energy consumption can expect to make sacrifices if they want to support a just transition. Are there similar notions of sacrifice or abjugation of material resources in the decolonist hashtag land back vision? <laughs> I hate to say this, but I would need to repeat it. But I think that one of the th one of the best kind of statements of that uh, converge the uh, the decolonial sort of imperative with the uh, climate justice imperative is uh, from our friends and comrades and the Red Nation through um, a position that they've taken on called the Red Deal, and it does a really good job of kind of making some transformative policy suggestions that wed all of like black liberation, the liberation of BIPOC people with environmental racism and decolonization wrapped, wrapped into one. And it does take sacrifice and it takes sacrifice on all, uh, by all communities involved. Um, one of the things I always like to think is the more resistant that privileged sectors feel uh, towards um, towards any sort of policy proposal around whether it's like decolonizing in its in its spirit or or um, advocates for more radical sustainability with respect to how we exist in relationship to our our environments um, the more stink that people make over that and whining about um, about the sacrifices that they individually or collectively have to make I think the more um, the the better your proposals are doing um, if you're advocating climate justice where people feel pretty comfortable with um, the sacrifices that they'll have to make it means that it's not significant enough for the damage to rectify the damage that we've done to our natural world if reconciliation or decolonization isn't being um, huffed and hawed about by privileged sectors of the economy or, or of, the, of the colonizing state, then we're not doing enough to, to actually produce the ends of decolonization that we claim to be. People should be pissed off. There's been like centuries of amassed wealth and privileged on the backs of uh, BIPOC communities and rectifying that is going to take a little bit of effort and pain for some who have amassed that privilege over those centuries. 
So the more that you hear people resistant to these ideas, I think, um, and the more stink that they raise about it, the better, the better, the more likely that our, our that the programs we're offering and the practices that we're um, suggesting as our way forward are, are right and, and um, in the right spirit and, and possibly doing the, uh, the potential material transformations that we need to make a better world. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, to everyone else who dropped a question in the Q&A, thank you so much um, for doing so, but we are just about out of time here. So that actually concludes um, the Q&A portion and wraps up our program today. Um, I'd like to thank you so much again, uh, Professor Glenn Coldhard for being here today, um, for sharing your work, your thoughts, um, and for all that you do on behalf of Indigenous communities. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to talk with you and speak with you. And I'm so, so happy we got to share our discussion um, with almost 100 attendees who tuned in. Um, and for everyone who is here, please join us um, for the next SIS event, which will be held next Wednesday, March 17th here on Zoom. We will show you a slide shortly for more information. Um, so again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm Elizabeth Rule and um, our esteemed guest, Glenn Coldhard. Thank you for being here today. It was a pleasure to meet with you. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you again, Elizabeth, for the fierce work that you do and for the questions that you provided. Uh, also to Kate for helping organize this um, kind of behind the scenes and for Christine uh, for the wonderful introduction. Um, so Masicho, thank you.